Hello and a very warm welcome to the channel. It's time for another History Reacts video. So I'm very excited about this one. It's from a whole new channel. Uh, the channel is called History Matters and it's about the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. Of course, that immediately preceded the Second World War. Um, I mean, to some extent, it was almost a training ground for the Second World War, although admittedly that sounds, that's, that's a pretty harsh way of putting it for the Spanish people. It was a really weird war because it was a kind of war of different ideological coalitions. So on the on, on the nationalist side, on, on what became Franco's side, I mean, Franco wasn't actually the leader initially. Um, you had a mixture of Flan, phalangists who were fascists. You had um, deeply religious Catholic conservatives. You had even had some monarchists. Um, you had a lot of, ironically, a lot of troops from Spanish Spain's overseas colonies in North Africa. And then on the other side, on on the Republican side, you had a mixture of kind of fairly moderate socialists. Um, you had anarchists, syndicalists, uh, full-on communists, and of course, the the Republicans were backed by the Soviet Union, and the nationalists were backed by Italy and Germany, and crucially, the main democratic powers, so Britain, France, and the United States, all all stayed out. It was just the, the kind of the authoritarian countries that got involved on each side, which I'm sure had a, a pretty big bearing on the outcome. But anyway, um, so the, the video is called 10 Minute History, the Spanish Civil War and Francisco Franco. Gives you a good idea how long it's going to last. Um, and as I hope, please, please do subscribe if you haven't already, and let's play the tape. 1930, and in Spain, things are getting a bit tense. It was <laughs> that, at this that. point led by King Alfonso XIII and his Prime Minister slash dictator, General Miguel Primo de Rivera. Rivera was hugely... So, so the context, I think it's really interesting to think of how Spain declined as a power um, in the kind of the, the lead up, or, or, or to be honest, in a century, in a century and a half almost, leading up to the Spanish Civil War. I mean, Spain was, Spain and Portugal were kind of the two original great European powers. Um, colonized almost almost all of South America, Central America between between them, um, but their, their fall from grace came much earlier than was the case with most of the European powers, especially in the space of Spain, who was occupied during the Napoleonic War, never really got over that. I mean, during it all, and during the same time, its colonies broke away in various independent struggles. So Spain was had kind of been like the. It was, it was still a European power, but it was very much a sick European power and had been for about a century at this point. So popular and had cracked down on many democratic opponents and he'd also alienated the army which led to his resignation in January. He was replaced by army. General Damaso Berenguer who continued the dictatorship but Spaniards named it Dicta Blanda or the soft dictatorship. Mm. Opposition to the dictatorship and the monarch who maintained it continued to grow during 1930 until the outbreak of an uprising in Caca here. This uprising was crushed and Alfonso chose to replace Berenguer in 1931 with Admiral Juan Batista Aznad who called for local elections. The opposition, known as Republicans, won and went one step further by declaring Spain a democratic republic and Alfonso, who couldn't count on the military for support, simply left. This ushered in the period of the Second Spanish Republic, which incidentally was one of the few nations to have the colour purple on its flag. Yeah, and, and that flag is still um, still used today in various... I mean, you, you sort of see it in protests sometimes in Spain. It's, it's basically a symbol of the Spanish left. A new provisional government led by... Nisita Obviously Spain is, 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 has gone back to being a monarchy. Teto Azalaza Moda was established and quickly began to implement reforms. In June 1931, an election was held to elect men for a constitutional Cortes which would draft the new Spanish constitution. This constitution included things such as freedom of speech and assembly, as well as the separation of church and state. It also important. And the church and state is a really big one. Um, the Catholic Church was immensely, immensely powerful in Spain at this time. Um, and I mean, I, I, actually, a, a lot of the, the Red Terror, which happened during the Spanish Civil War, was directed at the Catholic Church, which was seen as being oh, extremely oppressive, of, of course. Um, in no way justifying the horrible acts of violence which took place against the church. And they placed the church's money under the control of the government and prevented religious orders from teaching in state schools. This mm. upset many of the deeply Catholic population yeah. and led to Asala Thamoda, himself a very religious man, resigning his position of Prime Minister in October. He wasn't jobless for long, however, since he was elected to the mostly ceremonial role of President by the Constitutional <laughs> Cortes in November. <laughs> his replacement as Prime Minister was a man called Manuel Athania, who was a left-wing Republican and wanted to push through major reforms. You may have noticed that neither of these two were elected in general elections, and in fact, the Constitutional Cortes continued to govern the nation well after the constitution was finished, not very democratic. Mm. Athania continued to bring in reforms, such as expanding the franchise to women in 1933 and redistributing land from the rich to the poor. 
Further reforms included granting greater local autonomy to Catalonia and the Basque Country and shrinking the size of the army. Athania struggled to keep public order though and after some revolts which were quickly crushed it became clear that the Spanish people no longer wanted him in charge and so elections were called in 1933. Athania lost and was replaced by a right winger called Alejandro Larue who sought to reverse many of the previous reforms. Larue struggled to govern effectively and when it became clear that his government would be a very conservative one the socialists demanded a general strike to bring the country to a halt. This led to the Astorius Rising, which saw armed socialists seize Oviedo in October of 1934. The army put this revolt... Yeah, so this is an important context. I mean, the Spanish Civil War wasn't just an act of political violence which broke out kind of with, with, with no context. Um, there had been very serious political violence in Spain early in the 1930s before the Civil War. And the Civil War was, of course, far more intense. Um, but it, it was building on some, it was building on pre-existing troubles. It, it wasn't a sudden eruption. Bolt down, and so left-wing parties realised that they needed to cooperate if they were to regain power, and so together formed the Popular Front in 1936. Mm. Larue's government collapsed due to a financial scandal, and elections were called, which saw the Popular Front led by Athania win. Athania soon after ousted Al Salathamada as president and took his place, but his presidency was tarnished by local violence between left and right-wing groups. Yeah. The most notable of these... And the amount of um, violence, it, it, not, not just in Spain, um, it was the same in France, it was the same in Germany, same in Italy, until the fascists had conclusively won. Um, political violence between the hard left and the hard right was endemic in Western Europe in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. Um, there, there were attempted revolutions and counter-revolutions in pretty, well, I I excluding Scandinavia, um, the UK, Bel Belgium and the Netherlands, pretty much all of Western Europe had some kind of either attempted or successful um, a rising of even the extreme left or the extreme right, and, and street fighting was very common. I mean, we, we, it's, it was the fact that France survived as, as a democracy to the beginning of the, of the Second World War is actually quite impressive when you see what France went for went through. But that's probably a subject for another video. Right wing groups was the Falange, which was modelled on the fascist parties of Europe, and whose leader yeah. Jose Antonio had been arrested. So the, 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 the Falange's slogan um, was, ironically, "Long live death." Which is uh, <laughs> you got. I mean, I've got to admit, it's a slogan, right? Um, the the Catholic conservatives, the, who were also fighting on the same side during the Civil War, their their slogans: "Viva Cristo Rey," "Long live Christ the King." I can't actually remember what "Long live Death" is in Spanish. It might be "Viva Viva Guerra," is it? I don't know. Please, please correct me if you know. Rested. The breakdown of civil order and the promises of greater autonomy to the regions worried many in the army who thought that the country would disintegrate. Led by General Moller, much of the army planned to oust the government to stop this. Both sides started assassinating members of the other, and the most notable of these was the murder of Jose Calvo Sotelo, the leader of the monarchist party. This left basically no notable right-wing leaders, and so the army decided now that this was the time for a coup to begin. The elite African army began a revolt in Spanish Morocco on July the 17th, 1936, seizing it, and they were soon after joined by their leader, a certain Francisco Franco. Yeah. The expectation was that the... So the, the, the Spanish army in Morocco was basically the, the best of the Spanish troops because they'd been putting down, or rather, um, they'd been fighting against insurgency for the past couple of decades. And by this point, they pretty much were under control. And actually, a lot of Moroccan troops would fight on the nationalist side um, in, in the Spanish Civil War. I mean, admittedly, how much choice they had is, is questionable. The Republican government would surrender. It didn't. Instead, the new Prime Minister, José Giral, issued weapons to unions and workers to fight the army. The rebels mm. had the advantage of the support of most of the army, whereas the Republicans had the navy on side, as well as the industry and resources of most of Spain. By the end of August, though, the front lines looked like this, with the rebels, now calling themselves the Nationalists, controlling about a third of the country. In October, the Nationalists proclaimed General Franco as the head of state because all of the other leaders, like Mola, had died. Yeah. Since the arrested José Antonio of the Falange Party had been executed, Franco placed himself as its new leader. So both the Nationalists and the Republicans had their... Yeah, so there's a really interesting story, um, almost a kind of war within the war, both on the um, on the Nationalist side and on the Republican side. So on the Nationalist side, it's really interesting to see how Franco was able to consolidate power over the various disparate factions of the Spanish right, um, sometimes using quite brutal methods. On on the Republican side, I mean, there was actual, there, there, was, there was open fighting, open warfare between some of them. Um, so for example, the, the, the Palma, which was a kind of anarchist militia, particularly powerful in Barcelona, or anarcho-syndicalist is probably a better description, um, were involved in direct street fights and were eventually crushed by the communists. And if, so if, you, if, you, if you want to read a good book on this, George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia um, is, was generally a really good book. It particularly details the spite the fighting between Spanish anarchists and Spanish communists who were theoretically meant to be on the same side. 
foreign backers in the civil war. Of course, the fact that the USSR was backing the communists was a, a, a very big reason why they were sort of slowly gaining strength. And ironically, as the communists became a stronger and stronger element within the Republican forces, that made the UK, France, or France in particular, um, less inclined to, to intervene in any way. The nationalists were supported by Portugal, Italy and Germany, whereas the Republicans were given aid by the Soviet Union, Mexico and to a much lesser, unofficial extent, France. So by April 1937, <laughs> Spain looked like this, and it was in this month that one of the most famous events of the Civil War occurred, the bombing of Guernica by the German mm. volunteers, the Condor Legion. This bombing devastated the city, killing 5% of its population in one day. So, but both, uh, Italy, Italy sent a very large contingent of troops to, to support them, the nationalists. Germany was much smaller, um, it, 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 the, the, so the Condor Legion was... Uh, I mean, it, it, it was a, a, a purely air-based unit. It was much smaller than what the Italians sent, but it was very good. Um, on, on, on the other side, the, the Soviets sent quite a bit. So, it, to, to some extent, there was a kind of like a learning curve for, for what happened during the, the Second World War. And of course, the, the terror bombing of, of Guernica would, would come to um, would, would come to be replicated right across Europe during the Second World War. But at, at the time, it was seen as an absolutely savage disgusting atrocity. As I say, it, it would five, ten years later, everyone was doing it. This wasn't the only atrocity of the war though. Both sides massacred civilians and prisoners and the nationalists operated concentration camps and used forced labour. So yeah, so uh, there was both a red terror and a what was called a white terror, so white being anti-communist terror. Um, but the, red, the red terror said earlier it was very aimed at religious institutions. Um, it, it wasn't as, in terms of number of people killed, the nationalists murdered um, far more people in their terror than, than the, the Republicans did, but there was definitely a hang on both sides. And also in, on both sides, infighting between the various groups um, definitely became quite violent. And as the communists gained power within the Republican faction, they had kind of quasi concentration camps for their opponents as well, many of whom were fellow leftists. The nationalists were able to conquer the north of the country, taking most of Catalonia by the end of 1938. It was here, incidentally, that George Orwell fought and became yeah. disillusioned with communism and with bullets since he got shot in the throat. <laughs> yes. One of the reasons that the Republican side struggled was that it contained many diverse political groups, such yeah. as communists, socialists, liberals and anarchists. So, as I say, this is very true, but the same is also true of the, um, the nationalists. But what, what the nationalists did very successful, what Franco was able to do, is to unite the, the disparate factions around himself. And no one on the Republican side really managed that to the same extent. These factions often bickered and sometimes attacked one another, meaning unity was all but impossible since they had different end goals. In February 1939, the Nationalists conquered Barcelona and Britain and France recognised Franco Hello. It was the Spanish yeah. head of state. The next month saw the fall of Madrid and the Republican leadership flee. So it's, it's a really interesting question as to why Britain and France... Well, France in particular was interested in intervening. Um, as, as this video said, they did provide sort of some support, just not very much. Um, Britain was much, much more reluctant. I, I think France probably would have been up for intervening had Britain intervened. Um, but say, Britain just really wasn't interested, in part because of domestic anti-communism. Um, but it, it, it plausibly could have happened, and, and then you'd be looking at a very different scenario. I mean, there, there were very big what we call international brigades fighting on the Republican side. So um, kind of anti-fascists, in, in practice, they tended to be communists, but, but not always volunteers from all across Europe and indeed beyond. Um, I, I think there, there, there was definitely an American battalion, there was a British battalion, lots of um, it, Italians who'd, who'd fled from Mussolini. And so, so it, it, it was a very international conflict. It's, it's ironically, almost more on the nationalist side because they had um, the Germans and Italians. On April the 1st, Franco announced an end to the civil war and a nationalist victory. Hmm. Franco now had the job of securing his power and rebuilding the country. Spain was formally declared a one-party state with Franco as its leader. Franco is often described as a fascist and in many ways this is both right and wrong since yeah, he and his I'll regime defied categorization. He did use force to repress dissent and the independence movements of Catalonia and the Basque country and he put the needs of the regime above those of the population. However, he did respect private property and made little effort to police people's private thoughts and actions. People were free to leave Spain, many positions in government were appointed on merit, and some criticism was tolerated so the regime could adapt. So almost immediately after the Civil War was over, a little-known event called World War II. <laughs> so, um, going back to kind of the, the ideological question, I, yeah, I, I, fascism is such a hard thing to define. Um, so many people have tried and no one can ever agree on exactly what it is. 
I think most people, were, most serious historians would agree that Franco Spain was at the very least less fascist than either Hitler Germany or Mussolini's Italy. Um, it, was, it was a very authoritarian state, but there was, there was much more power sharing. In particular, there was quite a bit was left of the church. Uh, whereas, uh, I mean, in, in Hitler's Germany, the church was pretty much subordinated to the state. Um, Obviously, obviously, so in, in World War II, he's probably about to go into this, but Spain stayed resolutely neutral, which infuriated Mussolini and Hitler. They kind of felt they'd been betrayed. And if Spain had joined in, it, it would have been very useful. They, they, they would have had a good shot at taking Gibraltar and therefore cutting Britain's access to the Mediterranean. Um, but, but they didn't. And obviously, hence the, um, the, the Franco regime was not deposed by the Allies after the Second World War. Franco kept Spain out of the war despite close ties to Germany and Italy, mainly because Spain was still a smouldering wreck and wouldn't have been able to do much <laughs> anyway. This doesn't mean that Franco completely ruled it out though. Hitler wanted to move his troops through Spain to capture Gibraltar, but Franco's demands were too high. The price of Spanish help was forgiveness for Spain's debts, and Franco also wanted Germany to provide most of the equipment. Franco's demands angered Hitler, who even threatened to give Catalonia to Vichy France, but in the end, nothing happened. And, and France, they wanted lots of colonies as well, that, um, as, as the Spanish nationalists did. I mean, there's a... I, I can't... I'm, if it's one of those quotes, I'm not totally sure it's true or not, but um, after a meeting between Hitler and Franco, Hitler reported, reportedly said he'd rather have a tooth pulled out without an aesthetic than meet with that man again. That, that was how much... <laughs> They irritated him on a personal basis. Spain did, however, contribute some volunteers to the war, but after 1942 started to shift towards a passive support for the Allies. Mm. After World War II was over, Spain was internationally isolated since it didn't pick a side. It was also suffering from a sluggish economy, which mostly came about as a result of Franco's economic policy called autarky. Yeah. This was where Spain intentionally played very little role in international trade and sought to be entirely self-sufficient. This didn't go very well, and in the 1950s, <laughs> the regime had to implement major economic reforms which aimed at bringing in foreign investors. This included allowing for US military bases and placing emphasis on industrial development. Of course, a big part of the reason that the, the Franco regime in Spain and similar right-wing authoritarian regimes in Portugal and later in Greece survived so long was that even whilst the Western allies didn't particularly like them, um, especially because they've been somewhat fascist, well, in, in Franco's case, they've been fascist sympathetic during the Second World War, they were anti-communist and that made a huge amount of difference. So the, the liberal democratic powers, the end of the Second World War, didn't say they didn't like Franco, um, but they preferred him to the Soviet Union. Element ...instead of promoting agriculture as it had done previously. Spain still held the remnants of its once great empire and in 1956 Morocco gained its independence from France. As a result of this, Franco ceded Spanish Morocco to Mohammed V, its new king, but kept the territories of Ceuta and Melilla. Mohammed V wanted these as well as Ifni here and so in 1957 invaded. Long story short, the Spanish, with the help of the French, won militarily but in the peace negotiations decided to give Morocco this territory. The decade following the Ifni war was a pretty good one for Spain. The country opened up and the economy boomed, a large portion of which came from the growing tourism industry. Press censorship was relaxed and Franco turned a blind eye towards the growing underground political parties which opposed him. A lot of these changes were due to Spain wanting to join the international community and open up trade with its European neighbours. Yeah. Most of these organisations, such as NATO and the European Economic Community, said no, but Spain was admitted to the United Nations in 1955. Hereafter, the remnants of the Spanish Empire were given up, with Ifni being ceded to Morocco in 1968 and Equatorial Guinea being given independence the next year. One territorial matter that was not resolved, though, was that of Gibraltar. Franco had made many diplomatic efforts aimed at regaining Gibraltar for Spain. Yeah, so Fr Franco um, essentially shut the border between Gibraltar and Spain. So, I mean, Gibraltar being a very small British overseas territory, which is physically connected to the Spanish mainland, I mean, it's part of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, it, was, it was a very poor Royal Navy base, but the, the, the problem for, I mean, I mean the, the British government nowadays, I don't think is that bothered about it. The problem is, from the Spanish perspective, is that the, the people in Gibraltar very much want to remain um, under UK rule and vote for it overwhelmingly in various referendums. So, I, 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 so ironically, Franco's um, attempts at intimidation and economic blockade probably strengthened their resolve. But all of them were rebuked, which led to him closing the border with it in 1969. 
So by the late 1960s, Franco was getting a bit old, and so measures had to be mm -hmm. taken to prepare for his death and succession. In 1947, Franco had promised to restore the monarchy. He began making true on that when in 1969 he appointed Prince Juan Carlos of the House of Bourbon as his successor. Incidentally, Franco had first asked the Habsburgs to take the throne, but they declined because at this point a Habsburg hadn't ruled Spain since the 18th century. Yeah. In 1973, Franco appointed Admiral Carrera Blanco as the President of the Council of Ministers, basically the Prime Minister. This was a time of growing unrest as workers demanded greater rights to go with their increased economic freedom. The economy began to slow down again, and even the church began backing social change and opposition groups. The late 60s and early 70s also saw the beginnings of ETA, a Basque terrorist organisation who were responsible for many bombings and political assassinations. The most notable of these occurred in December 1973, when ETA managed to blow up Admiral Blanco on his way to Mass. Blank Ironically, the, the problem with ETA, or ETA, I think as they're more commonly called, um, became worse once Spain transitioned to a democracy. Um, I mean, they, they only finally disarmed in the early 2000s. They, they were going for, it, it's a relatively recent thing, but it has stopped being a, an, an active organisation. Franco was replaced by Carlos Arias Navarro, who struggled to maintain order. In 1975, after suffering from repeated bouts of illness for many years, Franco died and was succeeded by the prince who became King Juan Carlos I. Juan Carlos immediately began to lay the foundation for a transition away from dictatorship to democracy. He asked Arias Navarro to resign and appointed a man called Adolfo Suarez as his replacement. Juan Carlos and Suarez had both promised to uphold the Francoist constitution and maintain the dictatorship. Fun fact, no. They began to work behind the scenes to pressure Francoist politicians to dissolve the parliament to begin democratic elections. The king. I mean, it, it's a really interesting case of democracy being almost top down imposed. Um, oh, well, that, that, that's not quite true because clearly there was massive pressure from below and there was general disillusionment with the Franco regime. But the fact it was the king who played such a crucial role in, um, in establishing Spain's democratic regime is really interesting. Lifted the ban on opposition political parties, even the Communist Party, in 1977. In June of the same year, there was an election which women could vote in and Suarez's party, the UCD, won with the Socialist Coalition coming second. In 1978, a new constitution was written enshrining civil liberties and granting regional autonomy to both Catalonia and the Basque Country. After this, barring a failed coup in 1981, Spanish democracy remained strong and it was welcomed back into the international community. Spain's period of authoritarianism had come to an end, and the work of Juan Carlos I in this is hard to overstate. He and Suarez had resisted immense internal pressures and stunned international onlookers by quickly and peacefully dismantling the Francoist system and ushering in a new age for Spain. It, it was, it genuinely... I hope you enjoyed this episode. It genuinely is very impressive. Um, the, the extent to which that transition was peaceful, so from a very authoritarian... I mean, I, mean, I suppose you would kind of think that the regime just ran out of puff in the same way that the communists did in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, they so demonstrably failed, their, their economy just was... Um, by comparison to the, the wealthier states like France and the UK, the, the Liberal Democrats and Germany, the Liberal Democratic states, it, it just obviously not worked. Um, but yeah, anyway, that, that was really interesting. If you haven't already, please do subscribe. Uh, please hit a like. I hope to see you for the next video.